Hello everyone. In 2019, I found myself driving through the Sahara, intent on experiencing the profound silence and boundless horizons I'd been told could recalibrate the soul. It was mid-June, and the relentless sun turned the sky into a dome of molten copper. The journey started from a small town on the edge of the desert, my SUV loaded with supplies, maps, and the kind of naive confidence that can only be born from ignorance. I was following a route that, according to my research, would lead me through some of the most scenic parts of the desert and back to civilization within a week. On the third day, the whispers started. It was subtle at first, a mere brushing of sound against my ears, like the rustle of silk. But as I drove on, the whispers grew more insistent, forming words I couldn't understand in a language that felt ancient, woven into the very fabric of the desert. By the fourth day, my situation took a dire turn. A sudden sandstorm rose with a fury, reducing visibility to zero and forcing me to stop. When the storm finally abated, I found my SUV buried up to the axles in sand, and with a sinking feeling, I realized I was hopelessly lost. The storm had erased my tracks and any sign of the path I had been following. It was then, amidst the vast and indifferent expanse of the Sahara, that I heard the whispers again, clearer now. They seemed to be calling me, pulling me towards something. Driven by a mixture of desperation and irrational curiosity, I started walking, following the direction of the whispers. After what felt like hours under the scorching sun, I saw it an ancient ruin that seemed to materialize out of the shimmering heat. Structures of stone and sand that were not marked on any map, that no guide had ever mentioned. The whispers grew louder, guiding me into the heart of the ruins. There, in a courtyard overshadowed by crumbling walls, I found the source of the whispers. A well so deep that looking into it was like gazing into the night sky, stars twinkling from its unfathomable depths. The whispers emanated from down below, a chorus of voices that pleaded, warned, and beckoned. I don't know how long I stood there, entranced by the well's dark allure. The next thing I remember is waking up beside my vehicle, the ruins nowhere in sight, as if they had never existed. The experience in the desert changed me. I returned with an unshakable feeling of having been touched by something ancient and incomprehensible. The whispers occasionally visit me in my dreams, a ghostly reminder of the Sahara's vast, mysterious embrace. I can't explain what happened. Was it a mirage, a hallucination brought on by heat and isolation? Or did I stumble upon something real, a relic of the past that defies our UND understanding of time and space? The desert keeps its secrets, but sometimes, in the whisper of the wind, I think I hear the echoes of that ancient well, calling me back to the heart of the Sahara. In the heart of a merciless winter in 2021, I found myself stationed at a remote research facility in Antarctica, a world painted in shades of white and blue, where the sun barely grazed the horizon before retreating into prolonged darkness. It was here, amidst the howling winds and endless ice, that I stumbled upon an anomaly that would haunt me for the rest of my days. It began on a particularly bitter evening when the storm outside confined us to the warmth of our makeshift home. With the wind screaming like lost souls against the walls, I sought solace in tinkering with an old radio. As I adjusted the dials, aimlessly searching through static and the ghostly whispers of wind interference, a sudden crackle pierced the silence, followed by a clear, distressing signal. The voice that came through was panicked, urgent, speaking of water flooding in, of a ship being torn apart by the ice. The coordinates given were eerily close to our camp, but what chilled my blood was the date of the distress call it was from a century ago, from a ship that legend had it. 
driven by a mix of scientific curiosity and an inexplicable pull to the voice's desperate pleas. We followed the coordinates, our path lit only by the weak glow of our flashlights and the occasional flicker of lightning illuminating the monstrous iceberg surrounding us. As we approached the location, the signal grew stronger, the voice more desperate. And then, amidst a clearing in the ice, we found it not the sunken ship, but an old, frozen radio transmitter. The impossibility of our discovery, a century-old transmitter broadcasting a live distress signal, we decided to take the device back to our base for further investigation, a decision that marks the beginning of our nightmare. Back at the base, the radio became an object of both fascination and dread. The voice continued to cry for help, repeating its message over and over, as if trapped in a moment of despair. Despite our efforts to trace its origins, the mystery only deepened. The ship it mentioned had indeed sunk a century ago, all hands lost. As days turned into weeks, the atmosphere in our small community grew heavy with paranoia and fear. Equipment malfunctioned for no apparent reason, shadows seemed to linger longer than they should, and the cold felt more invasive, as if it was reaching inside us, gripping our hearts with icy fingers. The climax of our horror came one night when, driven by a madness I cannot explain, I ventured out into the blizzard alone, drawn to the location of the original distress signal. There in the darkness I found not the tranquility of snow and ice, but a scene of chaos and destruction, a vision of the ship in its final moments, as real and as terrifying as if it were happening right before my eyes. I screamed into the wind, pleading for the vision to end, and when it finally did, I was left alone on the ice, the silence more oppressive than ever. The radio, when I returned, had fallen silent, the distress signal gone as if it had never been. In the weeks that followed, our team was evacuated, our mission deemed too risky to continue. The radio was lost during our hurried departure, or perhaps it chose to remain hidden in the ice, a frozen echo of a tragedy long past. To this day, I cannot explain what happened in that desolate wilderness. Some believe it was a trick of the mind, a hallucination brought on by isolation and the extreme conditions. Others whisper of supernatural forces at play, of souls trapped in ice, reaching out across time for salvation. As for me, I am haunted by the memories, by the voice that called out from the past. In the vast, unexplored depths of Antarctica, there are secrets yet to be uncovered, whispers waiting to be heard in the frozen echoes of time. In 2018, my curiosity as an ethnobotanist led me to a part of the Amazon not yet swallowed by modernity's concrete grass. The locals spoke of a forest that remembers, a place where the trees whispered the fates of those who dared their depths. As someone who'd always been fascinated by the symbiotic relationships between flora and humanity, this was a siren's call I couldn't resist. Our expedition was small myself, two seasoned guides and an eager young sound engineer named Marco, who'd heard rumors of trees capable of capturing and replaying sounds. We sought to document this phenomenon, perhaps to unveil a new marvel of the natural world. The deeper we ventured, the more the forest seemed to close in around us, a verdant maze alive with unseen eyes. It was on the fourth night, under a choir of stars, that we first heard it voices. Not the calls of nocturnal creatures, but human voices, laughter mingled with cries, emanating from the trees themselves. The sounds were muffled, as if coming through an old radio, relaying moments of joy and terror in equal measure. 
Marco, wide-eyed, set up his equipment trying to capture the eerie broadcasts. The guides exchanged nervous glances, speaking in hushed tones about turning back, but the lure of discovery chained our feet forward. The following days were a blur of wonder and dread. Trees, which at first glance seemed ordinary, held within their bark the echoes of a lost expedition, their hopes, and their despair. The closer we listened, the clearer the narrative became a group not unlike our own, filled with laughter and excitement, gradually descending into madness. Their joy turned to confusion, their confusion to terror. We heard their frantic running, their breathless hiding, the closing in of some unseen predator, and finally, our resolve wavered, but Marco's obsession pushed us onward. He was convinced that these sounds were a key to understanding an unknown aspect of nature. But as we delved deeper, the forest seemed to respond to our intrusion with a growing hostility. Shadows lengthened and the air grew thick with menace. Then, tragedy struck. Marco vanished. One moment he was there, adjusting his microphones beneath a particularly vocal tree, and the next, he was simply gone. Our search was frantic, calling his name into the indifferent wilderness, only to hear our own voices echoed back mockingly by the trees. We never found him, but for days as we tried to find our way back, we heard snippets of his voice among the cacophony of the forest's memory, his confusion, his fear. When we stumbled back into civilization, gaunt and haunted, our story was met with skepticism and disbelief. They searched for Marco, of course, but found nothing. The forest had claimed him, swallowed his story like it had so many before. I left the Amazon, but it never left me. Sometimes in the stillness of night, I swear I can hear the distant echo of the forest, whispering secrets I no longer wish to know. The Amazon is vast and ancient, a world within a world. I believe now that there are places within it that are alive in ways we can't understand, communicating in whispers of a language too old and too deep for human minds to grasp. The forest remembers, yes, but it also hides, and what it hides, I pray, will never be found by man again. Beneath the relentless Australian sun, where the horizon blurs into a mirage of endless okra and azure, our story unfolds. The outback, vast and unforgiving, holds secrets whispered on the wind, but seldom believed by those who hear them. It started as an adventure among friends, a journey into the heart of the unknown, armed with nothing but our wits and an insatiable curiosity for the stories untold. Our destination was nowhere, for the thrill lay in the journey itself, or so we thought until the day we discovered Mirage Town. As the sun dipped low, painting the sky in hues of fire and blood, a silhouette emerged on the horizon, a town untouched by the maps and unknown to the locals we'd queried along our path. The people of Mirage Town greeted us with open arms and smiles, a stark contrast to the desolation that surrounded their haven. They dressed in fashions long forgotten, their manners and speech tinged with the flavor of yesteryears. They claimed to be remnants of the past, a community lost in time appearing only to those deemed worthy or in dire need. We spent the night enchanted by their stories and warmth. They spoke of the world beyond, as if it were a distant memory, a life once lived, but now only dreamed. Their tales spun with the threads of history and mystery were captivating, yet beneath the surface, a sense of unease began to unfurl within me. The following morning, under the harsh light of day, Mirage Town was gone, dissolved into the ether from whence it came. Our disbelief was palpable, the taste of their hospitality still lingering, yet nothing but the untouched outback sprawled before us. Driven by a need for answers, 
we returned at sunset, and just like a mirage, the town reappeared. This time, however, the air was different, heavier, as if charged with a silent warning. The townsfolk, once jovial, now wore expressions of sorrow and caution. They spoke in hushed tones of a curse, a price for their timeless existence. Each sunset granted them life, but with each dawn they paid with their memories, their essence slowly eroding away into the sand and dust of the outback. Panic clawed at my insides as the reality of their situation dawned on me. We were witnessing the slow death of a community trapped in a cycle of ephemeral existence and inevitable forgetfulness. Their plea for remembrance, for someone to carry their story beyond the sunset, was a weight too heavy to bear. As night enveloped the town, a decision was made in hushed tones among my friends. We could not, in good conscience, leave Mirage Town to fade into obscurity. Our departure was swift, under the cloak of darkness, leaving behind the spectral town and its inhabitants, doomed to repeat their existence between the thresholds of light and shadow. The drive back was silent, each of us lost in the haunting reality of what we'd experienced. Mirage Town, a beacon of history, trapped in an endless loop of time, became our burden to bear. We were the carriers of their story, a tale so unbelievable yet so terrifyingly real. The horror lies not in the spectral appearance of Mirage Town, but in the realization of our own fleeting existence. In the vastness of the Australian outback, we found a story that clung to the fringe of reality, a reminder of the ephemeral nature of life and memory. The true terror was in forgetting, in being forgotten, lost to the endless march of time like the shifting sands beneath our feet. Under the sweltering sun, my weary eyes caught sight of an anomaly on the horizon a silhouette that defied the endless expanse of the Bermuda Triangle's treacherous waters. Guided by curiosity and a mariner's intuition, I steered my vessel toward the unexpected discovery. What awaited me was an uncharted island, crowned with a lighthouse standing as a silent sentinel over the desolate shore. Its presence was a paradox, a beacon of guidance where no light had been known to shine. I anchored my boat and ventured onto the island, drawn by an inexplicable allure to the lighthouse. The structure, weathered by time and salt, stood as if guarding secrets long forgotten by man and sea alike. The door surprisingly creaked open at my touch, revealing a spiral staircase swallowed by darkness. With only the dim light of my flashlight, I ascended, each step echoing a chorus of whispers from the past. Reaching the top, I found the lantern room devoid of any modern technology or fuel that could explain the light I had seen from afar. The air hung heavy with the scent of the ocean, and something else something ancient and unnameable. As the sun dipped below the horizon, enveloping the world in twilight, a chill descended upon me, not from the evening breeze, but from the realization that I was not alone. Without warning, the lighthouse burst into life, its beam cutting through the darkness like a knife. Yet, the mechanism remained still, untouched and unpowered. The light, impossibly bright and unnervingly cold, illuminated the surrounding sea, revealing shadows that danced just beneath the surface, shapes that human eyes were never meant to see. Panic took hold as the ground beneath me trembled, the air filled with the sound of distant voices, calling from the deep, lamenting sailors and ships lost to the triangle's embrace. I stumbled down the staircase, the light from the lighthouse now, a beacon of malevolence, chasing me away from its cursed shore. I reached my boat and fled into the night, not daring to look back at the island that should not exist, guided by a lighthouse that defied explanation. The light, once a symbol of hope and guidance, had revealed a truth far more terrifying than any darkness, that some places on this earth are better left undiscovered, secrets that should remain hidden beneath the waves. To this day, the image of the lightless lighthouse haunts my dreams a reminder of the night when I gazed into the abyss, and it gazed back. The sea holds many mysteries, but some are too horrifying to contemplate. 
for in their revelation we find our own insignificance in the face of the unknown. In the heart of the Himalayas, amidst the towering, icy sentinels that pierce the sky, there is a place where the world seems to fold into itself, where echoes of the past bleed into the present. It was here, in these ancient mountains, that I found myself chasing shadows without form, a phenomenon as haunting as it is unexplained. Our expedition was drawn to these remote heights by tales of the unclimbed, by the siren call of adventure. Yet, what we encountered was beyond the realm of any mountaineer's ambition. The journey began under a sky so clear, it felt like we could reach out and touch the cosmos. Our spirits were high as we trekked through valleys and ascended slopes, each step bringing us closer to the unknown. The air thin and biting was a constant reminder of the environment's hostility. It was on the fourth night, camped beneath a canvas of stars, that the first whispers of unease began to circulate among the crew. The shadows danced on the periphery of our campfire's light, unattached to any body, mimicking our movements with eerie precision. At first we laughed it off, attributing the phenomenon to altitude sickness or tricks played by the firelight against the rocks. But as the days wore on, the shadows grew bolder, more distinct. They no longer fled at the approach of light instead, they seemed to absorb it, becoming clearer with each passing night. They mirrored our actions with uncanny accuracy, yet when we reached out to touch them, our hands met only the cold mountain air. Panic set in when our lead climber, Alexei, went missing. We found his tracks leading towards a sheer cliff beyond which there was only the abyss. The shadows were thick here, swirling in a silent, mocking dance. Maybe we searched for days, but the mountain yielded no trace of him. It was as if he had been swallowed by the very shadows we feared. The expedition disbanded shortly after, the mountain claiming more than just our ambition. I left with an unshakable feeling of being watched, of being followed. The shadows had not remained in the Himalayas. They had imprinted themselves onto the edge of my vision, a constant, dark reminder of what lies beyond the limits of our understanding. To this day, I cannot look at my own shadow without a sense of dread. The mountains hold many secrets, some of which are too dark for the light of day. The shadowy figures of the Himalayas remain an unsolved mystery, a tale of warning for those who tread too greedily on the untouched corners of the earth. The experience has left me with more questions than answers, the most haunting of which is whether we have been followed by the shadows, or if we were merely following them into the darkness. The whispers of the silent village reached me in a crowded, smoky bar in Moscow, where truths and lies danced together in the dim light. An old cartographer, his face as crumpled as the maps he cherished, spoke of a village in Siberia, abandoned overnight, its people swallowed by silence. His story, a blend of vodka and wistfulness, promised the perfect subject for my next documentary. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, I journeyed into the heart of Siberia, where the earth touches the sky and the wind tells stories of forgotten places. Arriving after days of travel through dense forests and across ice rivers, I found the village exactly as described silent, untouched, as if its inhabitants had simply vanished into the cold air. Persons' houses stood open, meals half-eaten on tables, and not a single footprint marred the snow's pristine blanket. It was a ghost town frozen in time, waiting for a return that would never come. I began filming immediately, moving through the village with a sense of unease that tightened with every step. The silence was oppressive, a tangible presence that seemed to watch me with unseen eyes. The night fell, and with it, an unshakable feeling of being followed. Shadows moved just beyond the reach of my camera's light, and whispers brushed against my ears words indistinguishable but filled with urgency. Sleep was a stranger those first nights, my dreams invaded by visions of faceless villagers, their silent pleas echoing in my mind. 
Determined to uncover the truth, I delved deeper into the village's heart, finding diaries and photographs that spoke of a simple life of joys and sorrows shared. But amidst the mundane, a darker narrative began to emerge, tales of a creeping mist that rose from the forest, bringing madness and despair in its wake. The final piece of the puzzle was found in the village's small church, a building untouched by the decay that claimed the rest of the town. The air inside was heavy with the scent of incense and old wood. On the altar, an open book, its pages filled with frantic scrawls that spoke of the mist's return, of how it whispered to them at night, twisting their thoughts, driving them to madness. The last entry, written in a shaking hand, simply read, we can hear it calling. We must go. There is no other way. As I read those words, a chill ran through me, the realization dawning that I was not alone. Whispers filled the church, a cacophony of voices that grew louder, more insistent. The mist had returned, seeping through the cracks, surrounding me with its cold embrace. A panic took hold as the whispers became screams, and I fled into the night, the mist close on my heels. I don't remember how I escaped, my memories a blur of fear and cold. When I awoke, I was miles from the village, the sun bright in the sky, the silence gone. The footage I had taken was corrupted, images twisted into shapes that made my heart race, whispers hidden in the static. The silent village remains a mystery, its story untold, a warning perhaps of places man was not meant to tread. I left a part of myself in that village, in the snow and silence. I still hear the whispers at night, a reminder of the truth that lies hidden in the Siberian wilderness, of a village that lost its voice to the mist, leaving only shadows and silence behind. As a marine biologist and avid scuba diver, I've always been drawn to the ocean's mysteries, its hidden worlds beneath the waves. The deeper the water, the more secrets it holds, secrets I've dedicated my life to uncovering. But nothing could have prepared me for what we discovered in the Marianas Trench, the deepest point on Earth. It was there in that abyssal darkness that we heard something that challenged our understanding of the ocean and its inhabitants. The expedition was funded by a private research institute with an interest in deep sea acoustic phenomena. Our objective was straightforward to deploy a series of hydrophones along the trench to capture and analyze the sounds of its depths. We were particularly interested in identifying patterns or anomalies that might indicate new species or geological activities. Our base camp was a research vessel equipped with the latest technology floating on the surface of a seemingly endless ocean. The descent into the trench was made in a submersible design to withstand the crushing pressure of the deep. I still remember the feeling of descending into the abyss, the blue light of the surface fading into darkness, the only sounds the creaking of the submersible and the beating of my own heart. For the first few days, our recordings captured the expected sounds of the deep, the distant calls of whales the occasional crack of shifting sea floor, the eerie silence of a world untouched by sunlight. But on the fourth day, as we were reviewing the data collected, we heard something that stood out from the natural symphony of the deep. It was a series of sounds that, at first, we couldn't quite place. They were rhythmic and structured, too deliberate to be the result of any known geological or biological activity. We isolated the sounds, playing them back at different speeds, analyzing their wavelengths, trying to find a logical explanation. The more we listened, the more it became apparent that these sounds resembled a language, a form of communication that was completely unknown to us. The realization was thrilling, but also deeply unsettling. What could possibly exist at such depths that was capable of producing these sounds? Intrigued and determined to learn more, we decided to extend our mission to try and capture more of these sounds, perhaps even locate their source. The days turned into weeks, with each dive bringing us closer to the mysterious communicator. The sounds grew more complex, more frequent, as if whatever was making them was aware of our presence. 
and was trying to reach out. Then, during what would be our final descent, we experienced something that changed everything. As we neared the bottom of the trench, the sounds suddenly surrounded us, louder and more intense than we had ever heard them. The submersible's lights flickered, its systems glitching under an unseen influence. And then, for a brief moment, something appeared on the sonar, a massive, moving shape that defied explanation, before disappearing into the trench's shadows. We surfaced in silence, each of us processing what we had witnessed. The recordings we brought back with us were analyzed by experts in linguistics, marine biology, and acoustics, but no definitive conclusions could be drawn. The sounds remained a mystery, a whisper from the deep that offered more questions than answers. Since that expedition, I've returned to the ocean many times, but the trench has remained off limits. The Institute citing technical difficulties is the reason, but I know it's more than that. There's something down there, something ancient and intelligent, hidden in the deepest parts of our planet's oceans. It's a reminder of how little we truly know about the world beneath the waves, a world that, perhaps, is best left unexplored. I've always been drawn to the enigmatic beauty of deserts, their vastness offering a sense of isolation that's both eerie and alluring. So when I first heard about the moving stones of Death Valley, it seemed like the perfect mystery for an amateur geologist and seasoned hiker like me to explore. Death Valley, known for its extremes, is a place where the ground simmers under the relentless sun, and the silence is so profound it feels like another world. The phenomenon of the sailing stones intrigued me. Rocks of various sizes, some weighing hundreds of pounds, trailed across the desert floor as if pushed by invisible hands, leaving behind long, inexplicable paths. Some scientists offered theories, but none fully explained the stones' eerie, seemingly autonomous movements. Armed with curiosity and a bit of trepidation, I set out to witness this phenomenon firsthand. I arrived in the late afternoon when the shadows began to stretch, turning the valley into a landscape from a dream. The air was still, the silence broken, only by the crunch of gravel underfoot. The racetrack playa, where the stones begin their mysterious journey, lay before me, a vast, flat expanse ringed by mountains. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, I set up camp. The desert cooled rapidly, and a profound chill settled over the land. Night in Death Valley brings an oppressive darkness, the lack of light a reminder of how remote and desolate this place truly is. I awoke some time after midnight to a sound that sent shivers down my spine a scraping, grinding noise that seemed both close and far away. Grabbing my flashlight, I ventured out of my tent. The moon, a slender crescent, provided little light but it was enough to reveal that several stones had begun their nocturnal journey across the playa. The sight was both mesmerizing and unnerving. Stones of varying shapes and sizes moved slowly across the ground, leaving trails in the soft earth. There was no wind, no seismic activity that I could feel, nothing to explain the movement. I followed one particularly large stone, its grinding echo a constant companion in the silent night. The air around it felt charged, electric, as if the stone moved through sheer will. I must have tracked it for hours, drawn by a fascination I couldn't explain. Eventually exhausted, I returned to my camp, the first light of dawn casting long shadows across the valley. I slept fitfully, plagued by dreams of moving stones and a deep, unsettling sense of being watched. When I awoke, the desert was once again still. The stones lay silent. Their nocturnal journeys ended. I packed my gear, eager to leave this place and its mysteries behind. But as I prepared to depart, I noticed something that chilled me to the bone. The stone I had followed, the one that had seemed so animate under the cover of darkness. The drive back was a blur of conflicting emotions, fascination, fear, and an overwhelming sense of relief at having left the valley. 
I've tried to make sense of what I witnessed, to rationalize it, but the memory of those moving stones, especially the one that seemed to seek me out, haunts my dreams. Death Valley remains a place of mystery, its secrets hidden beneath the scorching sun and cold, starlit nights. The moving stones are but one of its enigmas, a reminder of the many things that exist in this world beyond our understanding. My journey to the racetrack playa was meant to satisfy curiosity, but it left me with a deep-seated unease, a feeling that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Driving trucks has been my bread and butter for over two decades, hauling freight across the vast American landscape. I've seen nearly every corner of this country, from the bustling cities to the most remote stretches of wilderness. The highways and back roads are like veins and I, a mere blood cell coursing through. There's a certain stretch of road in the American Southwest, however, that's given me more chills than any ghost story ever could. It's a tale I've hesitated to share, fearing disbelief or worse confirmation. It was in the heart of summer during one of those long hauls, where the nights blend into days and the heat makes everything ahead shimmer like a mirage. I was on a tight schedule, pushing to make a delivery in a small town whose name I've since tried to forget. The route took me through a particularly desolate part of the desert, where the horizon stretches unbroken and the sky bleeds into the earth. Local lore had always whispered about a stretch of highway out here that wasn't what it seemed. They called it the Vanishing Highway, a piece of road that appeared on no map, a place where the laws of nature seemed to bend and time lost its meaning. I'd always dismissed these stories as the fanciful tales of folks with too much sun and not enough shade. That was until I found myself on that very road. It started with a detour, a supposed shortcut suggested by my GPS as I sought to shave a few hours off my drive. The road was there, clear as day on my screen, it had felt out of place, a slice of asphalt cutting through the desert, bordered by nothing but sand and scrub. As I drove, a sense of unease settled over me, a feeling of being watched, though I was the only soul for miles. The horizon ahead began to shimmer more intensely than the usual heat mirage. It was as if the road ahead was flickering, oscillating between being and nothingness. I rubbed my eyes, blamed the weariness, but the phenomenon only grew more pronounced. The asphalt beneath my wheels seemed to stretch endlessly, yet as I drove, landmarks would appear and disappear, rocks and cacti winking out of existence as I approached. I stopped the truck, heart pounding, not understanding, yet unable to deny what my eyes were seeing. The stretch of road ahead looked normal, but when I tried to walk towards it, it seemed to recede, always staying just out of reach with panic set in, a primal fear of being trapped in this limbo, in a place that defied all reason. I turned back to my truck, half expecting it to vanish like the rest of the landscape, but it remained solid, real. The drive back was a blur, my only thought to put as much distance between me and that accursed stretch of road as possible. When I finally emerged onto a familiar highway, the sun was rising, casting long shadows over the desert. I had lost hours, time that I couldn't account for, a gap in my memory as elusive as the road itself. In the days that followed, I tried to find the detour again, both on my GPS and through old-fashioned maps, but it was as if it had never existed. I spoke to locals, other truckers, anyone who might have heard of the vanishing highway, but their reactions were a mix of skepticism and fear, a reluctance to acknowledge such a place could exist. The experience has left me with more questions than answers, a haunting uncertainty that lingers like the afterimage of a bright light. Was it a trick of the mind, a hallucination brought on by fatigue and isolation, or had I stumbled upon something truly unexplainable, a crack in the very fabric of our reality? I still drive, though I stick to the well-traveled roads now, avoiding the shortcuts and detours that once made the journey interesting. The desert remains beautiful, vast, and mysterious, but there's a stretch out there that I pray to never see again, 
a reminder that some mysteries are best left undiscovered. Ever since I moved to a small village near the Trans-Siberian Railway for my research on remote Russian communities, I've been captivated by the region's history and isolation. The landscape is hauntingly beautiful, with vast expanses stretching out in all directions, untamed and untouched by time. It was here, amidst this frozen tableau, that I first heard the tales of the ghost train. The villagers spoke of it in hushed tones, a spectral locomotive that roamed the nearby abandoned tracks under the cover of night. These tracks, once a bustling conduit for trade and travel, had been left to decay, a relic of a bygone era. Yet the sounds of the train's whistle and the clatter of wheels on rails shattered the silence of the Siberian nights, a reminder of what once was. Skepticism was my initial reaction. The idea of a ghost train seemed like the sort of legend that flourishes in isolated communities, a story passed down through generations, growing with each telling. But as the winter nights drew in, and the darkness stretched out for seemingly endless hours, curiosity got the better of me. I decided to investigate, to record and perhaps understand this phenomenon. Equipped with my recording devices, I ventured out one bitterly cold night, following the old tracks that snaked it through the forest and vanished into the darkness. The moon was a sliver in the sky, barely casting enough light to outline the skeletal trees that surrounded me. The air was so cold it burned my lungs, and the snow crunched underfoot, the only sound in the oppressive silence. Then, just as I was beginning to doubt the tales, I heard it a distant whistle, faint but unmistakable, followed by the rhythmic pounding of a train barreling down the tracks. The sound grew louder, closer, until I could hear the hiss of steam and the groaning of metal. Ear racing, I pressed record, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of the approaching train. But there was nothing. The sounds enveloped me, so vivid I could almost feel the vibrations under my feet, yet the tracks before me lay empty, swallowed by the night. The cacophony of the ghost train passing was overwhelming, a sensory assault that defied logic. And then as suddenly as it had begun, it ceased. Silence reclaimed the night, leaving me alone with the recording that now held the echoes of the impossible. The next day I played the recordings for the villagers, expecting skepticism or accusations of trickery. Instead, I found belief, a resigned acceptance of the ghost train's existence. It was a part of their world, a spectral reminder of the past that refused to be forgotten. Some spoke of it as a harbinger, others as a curse. But all agreed it was best left unchallenged, a phenomenon beyond understanding. I left the village not long after, my research complete, but the experience stayed with me. The recording is a tangible piece of the inexplicable, a bridge between the known and the unknown. I've played it back countless times, each listen a journey back to that cold, dark night on the abandoned tracks. The sound of the ghost train, so real yet so impossible, challenges my understanding of reality, pushing the boundaries of what I believe is possible. The Trans-Siberian Railway continues to carry passengers and freight across the vast expanse of Russia, a lifeline that connects the remote corners of the country. But somewhere along its path, near an unnamed village, the past lingers, riding the rails of a long abandoned track. The ghost train of Siberia remains a mystery, a story without an end, a reminder that some things in this world defy explanation. As a captain of a modest-sized cargo ship that traverses the vast Pacific, I've witnessed many anomalies that the sea decides to throw at those daring enough to navigate her waters. Yet, nothing prepared me for the encounter with the island that isn't there, a phantom landmass that appeared and vanished like a mirage challenging my grasp on reality. Our journey was routine, transporting goods from South America to Asia, 
following paths plied by countless others before us. The sea was calm, the sky clear, an uneventful voyage until the third night out from our last port of call. It was then that the lookout reported lights on the horizon, an impossibility given our location, miles from any known land. I took to the bridge, peering into the night through my binoculars, and indeed, there was a distant glow suggestive of civilization, where no chart marked an island's existence. Curiosity, mixed with a sense of duty to explore uncharted territory, spurred a deviation from our course. As we approached, the lights grew brighter, outlining what appeared to be a mountainous island, its peaks reaching up to touch the stars. But as we drew nearer, a dense fog descended, enveloping us in a white shroud that the ship's lights failed to penetrate. We navigated carefully, relying on instruments to guide us through the blindness. Yet, no matter our efforts, the island remained elusive, the distance between us unchanged. It was as if the island was receding as we advanced, a trick of the mind or perhaps something more arcane. Hours we chased the phantom, until the first light of dawn began to dissolve the fog. The island was gone, vanished as if it had never been there, leaving only the open sea in its wake. Confounded, we resumed our original course, the encounter weighing heavily on my mind. I pored over charts and maps, consulted with experts and old sailors in port, but none could offer an explanation. The island was a non-entity, absent from any records, a figment that had appeared to multiple witnesses aboard my ship. Unable to shake my obsession, I organized a private expedition months later, determined to uncover the truth. We returned to the coordinates where the island had been sighted, equipped with the latest navigational technology. The days turned into weeks, with no sign of the island or anything out of the ordinary. The Pacific remained indifferent, a vast expanse hiding its secrets beneath waves that whispered of mysteries beyond human comprehension. On our return journey resigned to the unfathomable nature of our experience, the island appeared again, this time in broad daylight, undeniable and solid, a jewel of green and brown set against the blue. The excitement was palpable as we prepared to land, a sense of victory over the elusive. Yet, as we approached, a sudden storm erupted, as if conjured from nowhere. Towering waves and howling winds battered us, forcing a retreat to safety. When the storm abated, the island was gone, once more a victim to the caprices of the sea. We circled the area, but it was as if the earth had swallowed it whole, leaving no trace of its existence. The experience has left its mark, a tale too fantastic to be believed, yet too real to dismiss. I've sailed the Pacific since, eyes always straining for a glimpse of the island that isn't there, but it remains hidden, a secret kept by the ocean. It's a humbling reminder of our insignificance against the forces of nature, of mysteries that lie just beyond the reach of understanding, forever challenging the boundary between the known and the unknowable. As an architect specializing in the restoration of historic buildings, I've seen my share of oddities hidden within ancient walls, yet nothing compares to what I encountered at a remote Scottish castle, a project that promised to be the pinnacle of my career. The castle, nestled in the rugged highlands, was a relic of medieval times, its history as layered as the stones it was built from. My task was to oversee its restoration, preserving its historical integrity, while introducing modern comforts for its future as a museum. The discovery came unexpectedly. We were assessing the foundation, ensuring the structure's stability, when one of my team uncovered a narrow passage behind a wall in the cellar. It was an unusual find, not mentioned in any of the castle's blueprints or historical records. The passage led to a staircase descending sharply into the earth, far below the foundation level. Intrigued by the possibility of uncovering a previously unknown part of the castle's history, we decided to explore. Armed with flashlights and safety gear, we descended. The staircase was crudely hewn from the bedrock, spiraling down into the darkness. It was eerie, the air cool and damp, 
The only sound are footsteps and the occasional drip of water. Maybe we expected to find a cellar or perhaps a forgotten dungeon. Instead, the staircase seemed endless. We descended what felt like hundreds of steps, yet the bottom remained elusive. After what felt like hours, with our flashlights dimming and a sense of unease growing among the team, we made the difficult decision to turn back. The ascent was taxing, our muscles aching from the unaccustomed exercise, and a silent panic began to set in. How could this staircase exist? It defied all architectural and geological logic, descending far deeper than the foundation of any building should. Back on the surface, we debated our next move. Curiosity was a powerful force, but so was the instinctual fear of the unknown. I made the call to bring in experts, historians, and engineers to shed light on the staircase's purpose and construction. Yet, when we arrived, the passage we had uncovered was gone. The wall was solid, with no indication a door or passage had ever existed. It was as if the staircase and our descent into the earth had been a collective hallucination. But we had proof. The recordings from our helmet cameras showed everything the narrow passage, the descent, the seemingly endless staircase. The footage was unsettling, showing our descent into the impossible, our growing unease, and our decision to return to the surface. Yet, when we tried to show where we had entered the passage, the video showed us standing in front of a solid wall, talking and gesturing to nothing. The incident shook us all. I was left questioning my sanity, my understanding of the physical world, and the trust in my own memories. The project continued with the castle's restoration completed, but the atmosphere among the team had changed. There was a sense of relief when it was over, a shared desire to leave the castle and its mysteries behind. I've moved on to other projects, other ancient buildings with secrets of their own, yet the staircase in the Scottish castle haunts me. It's a mystery that remains unsolved, a story I hesitate to share for fear of disbelief or worse, understanding. It's a reminder of the limits of our knowledge, of the mysteries that lie hidden in the dark corners of the world, waiting just beneath the surface. I've always been captivated by the mysteries that lie beneath the waves, a fascination that eventually led me to become a marine archaeologist. The ocean, with its hidden realms and sunken treasures, held an allure that I couldn't resist. It was this passion that brought me to the coast of Japan to explore a recently discovered site that was rumored to be an ancient, submerged city. The first dive was surreal as we descended through the clear blue waters the silhouette of the city emerged from the depths, its structures intact, defying the ravages of time and sea. It was a breathtaking sight, buildings and streets laid out in a pattern that suggested a civilization unknown to our history books. But it was what we saw next that turned our scientific curiosity into an encounter we'd never forget. As our lights pierced the darkness, we saw them shadows moving through the streets and buildings of the underwater city. At first, we thought our eyes were playing tricks on us, a result of the refraction of light in water. But as we ventured further, it became clear that these were no illusions. The shadows moved with purpose, interacting with each other, seemingly going about their lives in a city that should have been devoid of life. The most unsettling part was the light. The city was lit, not by our dive lights, but by an eerie glow that seemed to emanate from the buildings themselves casting long, dancing shadows on the seafloor. It was as if the city was still alive, still bustling with the shadows of its inhabitants. We were mesmerized, caught between disbelief and the undeniable evidence before our, our eyes. Our mission had been to explore and document, but we found ourselves drawn deeper into the city, following the shadows as they moved through the streets. The sense of being watched grew stronger, a chilling realization that we were not alone, that the inhabitants of this underwater city were aware of our presence. In our fascination, we lost track of time and our air supply dwindled, forcing us to make a hasty retreat to the surface. Back on the boat, 
We reviewed the footage from our dive cameras, half expecting to find nothing but the empty ruins of a long lost city. But the footage confirmed our experience, showing the shadows and the inexplicable light that illuminated the city. The discovery should have been groundbreaking, a revelation that would change our understanding of history and humanity's past civilizations. But when we attempted to return to the site, we couldn't find it. The city had vanished, leaving behind nothing but the open sea. Our coordinates, once leading directly to the city, now pointed to empty water, as if the city had never existed. Again, we faced skepticism and disbelief when we shared our story in the footage. Many accused us of fabricating the entire encounter, a hoax crafted for fame or fortune. But we knew what we had seen, the mystery of the underwater city and its shadowy inhabitants etched forever in our memories. The experience has left me with more questions than answers, a haunting reminder of the mysteries that lie beneath the sea, beyond our understanding and reach. The ocean holds its secrets closely, revealing them only for moments before swallowing them back into its depths. The underwater city off the coast of Japan remains one of those secrets, a phantom city that appeared to challenge our perceptions of reality, then vanished as if it had never been, leaving only the shadows behind. In the vastness of the Nevada desert, where the horizon bleeds into a canvas of endless blue, I earn my living among the clouds. As a pilot for a small charter company, the sky was both my route and my home, a place of freedom untouched by the chaos of the ground below. But that untainted sanctuary wouldn't last. It began subtly during a routine flight from Las Vegas to a secluded airstrip near the border of Utah. Glancing out at the expanse, I noticed something peculiar a formation of clouds, unnaturally precise, spelling out return what you took I rubbed my eyes, attributing it to fatigue or a trick of light. Clouds don't conspire to form messages, I reasoned it must have been a fluke of nature, a one-time anomaly. Days passed, but the incident clung to me, an unsolved riddle in the back of my mind, then it happened again. This time, the message was clearer, more urgent, before it's too late I wasn't just puzzled, now I was alarmed. My initial disbelief morphed into a gnawing curiosity. I began documenting these occurrences, noting positions, times, even the conditions under which they appeared. The messages varied, each one more cryptic than the last, but all shared a tone of ominous warning. My colleagues were skeptical, dismissing my accounts as the fabrications of an overactive imagination. But then they saw them too. Whispers turned into heated debates and hushed tones in the break room, theories ranging from elaborate pranks to government experiments. But none of us could deny the reality of what we were seeing. The turning point came on a flight that I'll never forget, no matter how much I wish I could. The message was different this time tonight. They watched unease settled over me like a shroud. That night, as darkness enveloped the desert, I found myself drawn to the airstrip, an inexplicable urge guiding my steps. What I saw there defies explanation. Shapes, neither entirely solid nor wholly ephemeral, drifted between the planes, their forms vague and shifting like misgiven purpose. They moved with intent, searching, always searching, for what I couldn't say. I hid, watching in silent horror, until they vanished with the dawn. The messages stopped after that night. Life returned to a semblance of normalcy, but the shadow of those events lingers. I still fly, though every takeoff is a question, every landing a relief. The desert holds its secrets close, and the sky, once my refuge, now whispers of unseen eyes and hidden watchers. I don't know what they were looking for or if they ever found it. All I know is that some messages are not meant for us, and some mysteries are better left unsolved. This door, solitary and stark against the landscape, opens to a brick wall, yet locals whisper of times when the wall simply isn't. 
when the door becomes a threshold to somewhere or someone else. My curiosity, once peaked, became an obsession. With one twilight, under a sky bruised with the day's end, I ventured out. The air was thick with the scent of impending rain, and the door stood before me, as enigmatic as ever. With a trembling hand, I turned the knob and pushed. The wall greeted me, unyielding. Disheartened, I returned home under the cover of night, the door's mystery gnawing at me. Days turned into weeks, and my fascination only deepened. I began to hear tales hushed and hurried of those who had crossed the threshold into the unknown. Some returned, altered in inexplicable ways others never came back. The door was not just a local curiosity, it was a sentinel guarding secrets untold. It was on a night when the moon hung low and full that I witnessed the impossible. The air was electric, and the countryside was alive with a symphony of nocturnal creatures. As I approached the door, I felt a pull, an unseen force urging me forward. At the brick wall, it was gone. In its place, a corridor stretched into darkness, an invitation to the unknown. With a heart pounding in my chest, and a mix of fear and exhilaration coursing through my veins, I stepped through. The door swung shut behind me with a finality that echoed in the silence. Ahead, the corridor twisted and turned, leading me deeper into its depths. The air grew colder, and whispers filled the space around me, voices of those who had walked this path before. I emerged into a room that defied logic. The walls pulsed with a soft light, and shadows danced just beyond my sight. In the center, a figure shrouded in darkness beckoned to me. Words formed in my mind, not heard but understood. The price of curiosity is a tale untold. Panic took hold, a primal urge to flee, to escape this place where reality seemed a mere suggestion. I turned to find the door, but it was no longer there. The room shifted, walls closing in, and the figure advanced. Desperation lent me strength, and I ran, my footsteps echoing in a maze with no end. Time lost meaning. Was I there for minutes? Hours? Days? When I emerged, it was into the familiar fields of the countryside. The door stood closed behind me, innocuous, as if mocking my terror. The sun rose, painting the sky with the promise of a new day, but the darkness within me remained. I left the countryside soon after, carrying with me the scars of my journey, a reminder of the price paid for peering into the abyss. The door to nowhere remains, a sentinel between worlds, its secrets guarded and waiting for the next unwary soul. But I forever changed no better than to seek answers where none should exist. I've spent my whole life in Greenland, where the ocean whispers secrets to those willing to listen. I'm a fisherman, like my father before me and his father before him. The sea is in our blood, but some secrets once uncovered can never be buried again. It was mid-November, the sky a perpetual dusk, when we saw a ship encased in ice off the northern coast, far from any known shipping route. The sight of it was eerie, as if it had sailed straight out of a fog from another time, only to be swallowed by the ice. My curiosity peaked. I convinced my crew to investigate, a decision I regret to this day. As we drew closer, the silence was oppressive. The ship looked ancient, its sails tattered, the hull barely inside we found the crew. They were there, sitting at their posts, lying in their bunks, perfectly preserved by the cold. But something was off terrifyingly so. None of them had shadows. At first I thought it was a trick of the light, or lack thereof. But no matter how we angled our torches, no shadow appeared. It was as if the very essence of these men had been stolen, leaving only their frozen husks behind. The air around us grew colder, a chill that seeped into my bones, a warning to leave. But we didn't heed it. We explored further, finding the captain's log in his quarters. The entries were mundane at first, then grew increasingly erratic. The last entry was simply a date, two years prior, and the words, they are watching us from the shadows. 
That's when we heard it the sound of footsteps above us, pacing back and forth. But we were alone, the only living souls for miles. Panic set in, a primal urge to flee from an unseen predator, we scrambled back to the deck. But the ice around our boat had thickened, trapping us. Night was falling, and with it came shadows, or rather, the absence of them. The darkness seemed alive, moving, swirling around the ship, whispering promises of despair. We spent the night huddled together, fearing what lurked just beyond the reach of our lights. When dawn finally broke, the ice had receded enough for us to make our escape. We didn't speak of what happened, not at first. But the experience haunted us, each of us waking from dreams we couldn't remember, feeling watched, even in the safety of our homes. Weeks later, I went back. I can't explain why. Maybe I was looking for answers, or maybe I just needed to know we hadn't gone mad. The ship was gone, as if it had never been there at all. But I know what we saw, what we felt. It was a warning, a glimpse into a world beyond our understanding, a world where shadows dwell and watch, waiting. I still fish those waters, but I steer clear of the area where we found the ship. Sometimes, on the darkest nights, I think I see it again, just a silhouette on the horizon. And I wonder if, somewhere out there, it's still drifting, still waiting, its crew forever trapped in a moment of icy terror without a shadow to call their own. I've been an amateur explorer for years, drawn to the uncharted and the mysterious. My fascination led me to the Yucatan Peninsula, a place where ancient ruins whisper secrets of a past civilization, and the dense jungle hides more than it reveals. It was here amidst the labyrinth of synodes and caves that I encountered the Cave of Echoes, an experience that haunts me to this day. My guide, Louise, a local with knowledge passed down from generations, warned me about places in the jungle that even the bravest dare not tread. But the allure of discovery clouded my judgment. One sweltering afternoon, we found an unmarked cave, its entrance half hidden by tangled vines. Louise hesitated, his usual stoic demeanor replaced by a palpable tension. They say this cave speaks, he murmured, a note of fear in his voice I hadn't detected before. Driven by a mix of arrogance and curiosity, I insisted we enter. The cave welcomed us with cool air and an eerie silence, a stark contrast to the jungle's cacophony. As we ventured deeper, our torches flickered against the ancient walls casting long shadows that seemed to dance with a life of their own. I remember laughing, the sound bouncing off the walls, when the cave answered, not an echo, but a voice, or rather, voices mimicking my laughter but softer, almost with a hint of caution. Unnerved but fascinated, I called out, who's there? The cave replied in my own voice, turn back, not all discoveries are meant to be pursued. Louise urged me to heed the warning, but I was too caught up in the moment, rationalizing it as a natural phenomenon. We pressed on, the cave continuing to offer advice in echoes of our own voices. Beware the path you choose it whispered after a decision to fork left. Some doors are best left unopened, it advised, as we faced a narrow opening in the rock. The deeper we went, the more the cave seemed to plead with us to leave. Not all treasures are silver and gold it echoed as we stumbled upon artifacts that must have been centuries old. The air grew colder, the atmosphere heavier, and I began to feel a sense of dread I couldn't shake. It was when we found a chamber, its walls covered in ancient inscriptions, that the cave gave its final warning. Leave and never return it echoed in a chorus of our own voices, now tinged with desperation. The feeling of being watched which I had brushed off as paranoia, became overwhelming. Shadows moved just beyond the torchlight, and whispers filled the air, no longer just echoes of our own voices. Panic set in, and we fled, the cave's warnings following us, until we emerged into the sunlight, gasping for air. Luis refused to speak of what happened, and I left the Yucatan with more questions than answers. I've tried to rationalize the experience, to find a scientific explanation for the voices, 
and the overwhelming sense of foreboding. But deep down, I know we encountered something beyond our understanding, a guardian of secrets that did not wish to be disturbed. The Cave of Echoes remains a mystery, its warnings a reminder of the limits of human courage and curiosity. I've since hung up my explorer's hat, but the cave's whispers haunt my dreams, a chilling echo of a place that exists somewhere between myth and reality. I've never been one for superstitions or ghost stories. I considered myself a grounded person. That was until my trip to Thailand changed everything I thought I knew about the world. My adventure started innocently enough. I was traveling with a group of friends, soaking in the beauty and culture of Thailand. We had heard rumors of an island that appeared only once every few years, hosting a festival so grand it became the stuff of legends. The locals spoke of it with a mix of reverence and fear, a celebration you were lucky to witness once in a lifetime. They called it the Phantom Island Festival. Being the skeptics that we were, we laughed it off. But then, on a night when the moon cast a silvery glow over the sea, our laughter stopped. We were on a boat, heading back from a day trip, when the captain abruptly changed course. Tonight's the night he whispered, his eyes fixed on the horizon. We saw it then an island, where no island should be. Lights twinkling like stars had fallen to the earth, music drifting across the water. As we approached, the sounds of a festival in full swing filled the air laughter, singing the beat of drums. The island was alive, vibrant in a way that photos or stories could never capture. We disembarked, drawn to the celebration, like moths to a flame. It was surreal stepping into a party that, according to any map, shouldn't exist. The islanders welcomed us with open arms, adorning us with garlands and pulling us into the dance. It was as if we had stepped into another world, one untouched by time. The food, the music, the sheer joy of the festival was intoxicating. But as the night wore on, a feeling of unease began to settle over me. I noticed then that our hosts cast no shadows, their feet barely touching the ground as they danced. The air around us felt charged, the boundary between euphoria and terror thinning. I tried to brush it off as the result of too much drink, but the feeling persisted. I wandered away from the celebration, hoping to clear my head. That's when I saw her, a woman standing at the water's edge, staring out at the sea. She turned to me, her eyes hollow and whispered, you shouldn't have come here. Before I could respond, she vanished like smoke in the wind. Panic surged through me and I ran back to find my friends, but the festival had changed. The music was now a haunting melody, the laughter twisted into cries of despair. The islanders, once joyous, now appeared to me as spectral figures, their faces twisted in sorrow. We tried to leave, but the boats were gone swallowed by the darkness. We were trapped. As the night reached its darkest point, a silence fell over the island. The celebration vanished as if it had never been, leaving us alone on an empty beach. By morning, the island was gone, just as mysteriously as it had appeared. We were found by a passing boat, adrift and disoriented. When we tried to tell our rescuers what happened, they exchanged worried glances. You've been touched by the Phantom Island, one said solemnly. Consider yourselves lucky to be alive. I returned home, but the memory of that night haunts me. I wake from dreams of the island, the music, the spectral woman at the water's edge. The world feels different now, less certain. I've tried to find explanations, poring over maps and legends, but nothing makes sense. The Phantom Island Festival remains a mystery, a ghost story that I lived. I still don't fully understand what happened that night, but I know it's changed me. I've seen what lies beyond the veil of our reality, a glimpse of something both wonderful and terrifying. And I can't help but wonder if someday the island will call to me again. I've always had a passion for the unknown, 
the unexplored corners of the world that hide mysteries just waiting to be uncovered. It's what led me to become an avid hiker, seeking out the most remote trails, the ones that promise adventure at the risk of the unknown. My latest trek into the Alps was supposed to be just another notch on my belt, another story to tell. But what I found in a secluded valley far off the beaten path was beyond any tale I could have imagined. The day be began like any other on the trail. The sun was just peeking over the mountain peaks, casting a golden glow that made the snow-capped summit shine like beacons. My map showed a valley not marked by any trail, described in online forums as breathtaking and untouched. As I ventured closer, a strange feeling settled over me, a sense that I was stepping into a world apart. The air was cooler, the silence more profound. Entering the valley was like walking into a dream. The landscape was vibrant, more alive than anything I'd seen before. Flowers bloomed in brilliant colors, and the grass was a vivid green that seemed almost unnatural. But it was the silence that unnerved me, a stillness so complete it felt as if the world was holding its breath. I set up camp, intending to stay just the night. As the hours passed, however, I noticed something unsettling. My watch seemed to be malfunctioning, the hands moving at an erratic pace, sometimes spinning quickly, then moving slowly. I chalked it up to a mechanical fault, but the truth was far more unsettling. As the sun began to set, I felt an inexplicable weariness, a tiredness that seeped into my bones. Looking into the small mirror I'd brought, I gasped. My face, previously unmarred by time, now showed signs of aging. Those fine lines had etched themselves around my eyes and mouth, hair once jet black, now peppered with gray. Panic set in. I tried to leave the valley, but a dense fog had descended, obscuring the path I had come by. It was then that I realized the valley was changing me, not just my body, but my memories. I struggled to remember why I had come, the faces of friends and family fading from my mind like photographs left too long in the sun. The night passed in a blur of fear and confusion. When dawn broke, I found myself on the edge of the valley, as if it had released me from its grip. The aging had stopped, but the damage was done. I returned home, but nothing was the same. I was a stranger in my own life, a visitor from a future that I had never imagined. Friends and family were shocked at my appearance. My story met with disbelief and concern for my sanity. The valley remains a mystery, a place where time itself seems to twist and bend. I've searched for it again, driven by a need to understand, but it eludes me, hidden away as if it never existed. But I know what I experienced, the feeling of my life slipping through my fingers like sand. I've stopped hiking, the joy it once brought me overshadowed by the fear of what lies hidden in those remote places where the world is not as we know it. The Lost Time Valley changed me in ways I'm still trying to understand. It's a reminder of the fragility of our existence, the delicate balance of life that can be altered in ways we can't comprehend. The valley took something from me, something more precious than time. It took my certainty, my belief, that the world was a place I could know and understand. Now I live with the knowledge that there are mysteries out there beyond our understanding waiting in the silence of forgotten places. I've always been drawn to the unexplained, a trait that led me to pursue a career in investigative journalism. It's the thrill of the chase, the quest for truth that drives me. So when I heard rumors of a waterfall in Norway that flowed upwards, defying gravity and all scientific explanation, I was intrigued. The locals called it the reverse waterfall, a phenomenon shrouded in mystery and folklore. They spoke of it in hushed tones with a reverence that bordered on fear. This was a story I couldn't resist. I arrived in the small Norwegian village nearest to the waterfall during the heart of winter. The landscape was breathtaking, a pristine world of snow and ice. The villagers were welcoming, yet when I mentioned the waterfall, their warmth faded, replaced by a cold caution. 
It's not a place for outsiders, an elderly man told me, his eyes clouded with an emotion I couldn't quite place. It was a warning, veiled in the guise of concern, but it only served to fuel my determination. Equipped with my camera and a sense of invincibility that I would soon come to regret, I set out to find the waterfall. The journey was treacherous, the path obscured by snow with markers few and far between. It was as if nature itself was conspiring to keep the waterfall hidden. When I finally saw it, the sight took my breath away. Water flowed upwards, defying gravity, a silver ribbon against the stark white of the snow. It was beautiful, otherworldly, and completely inexplicable. I approached my camera ready, eager to capture this anomaly, to prove that the impossible was real. But as I neared, a sense of unease crept over me. The air around the waterfall was charged, electric, as if the very fabric of reality was thinner here. The water's flow wasn't just upwards, it seemed to twist and swirl in patterns that made my head ache if I looked too long. I started recording, my gaze fixed on the viewfinder, determined to document this marvel. That's when I heard it a whisper, barely audible, over the sound of the flowing water. It was a voice, or perhaps many voices, speaking in unison, a language I couldn't understand but felt deep in my bones. The ground trembled beneath my feet, a low rumble that grew in intensity until I feared the earth would split open. The air grew colder, the sky darker, as if the waterfall was swallowing the light. Panic set in, a primal urge to flee from something ancient and powerful, something that should have remained undiscovered. I don't remember running, but I must have, because the next thing I knew, I was back in the village, the waterfall a distant nightmare. The footage from my camera was gone, erased, as if I had never been there. But the memory remained, burned into my mind. The villagers avoided my questions, their faces closed off. It was clear they knew more than they were willing to say. But their silence was a message in itself. Some things are beyond our understanding, meant to remain hidden. I left Norway with more questions than answers, haunted by the voices of the waterfall. The story remains untold, a mystery that whispers in the back of my mind, a reminder of the arrogance of thinking we can comprehend all the mysteries of this world. The reverse waterfall flows on, a phenomenon that defies explanation, a reminder of the unknown that lies just beyond the edge of our understanding. It's a secret I pursued and wish I hadn't, a memory that follows me, a whisper in the dark that says some mysteries are best left alone. In the sprawling, frostbitten expanse of Russia lies a city that experienced an anomaly defying all logic and reason a phenomenon that would come to be known as the shadowless day. It was a typical winter morning when I arrived in the city for a business trip. The cold was biting, the sky a perpetual twilight, a characteristic of the northern winters. The city, a blend of Soviet-era architecture and modern aspirations, was no stranger to peculiar weather, but nothing could have prepared its residents or me for what was about to occur. On the morning of the shadowless day, I woke to a city bathed in an eerie, diffused light. The sun, a pale disk obscured by thick clouds, provided illumination but no warmth. It was on my way to a meeting, trudging through the snow-laden streets, that I first noticed the absence of my shadow. Initially, I thought it a trick of the light, a curious effect of the overcast sky, but the realization slowly dawned on me that it was not just my shadow that was missing. The people around me, the cars, the buildings, nothing cast a shadow. Panic hadn't set and yet confusion reigned. I watched as people stopped in their tracks, looking around, bewildered. The absence of shadows created a flat, almost two-dimensional appearance to the world, a surreal landscape void of depth and contrast. It was as if we had stepped into a painting, one rendered by an artist who shunned the use of shadows. The phenomenon became the talk of the city within hours. Speculation ran wild, theories abounded from scientific explanations, 
involving peculiar atmospheric conditions to wild claims of supernatural occurrences or government experiments gone awry. But as the day progressed, the absence of shadows began to instill an inexplicable sense of dread in the hearts of the city's residents and in mine. There's something fundamental about a shadow, a proof of existence, of being anchored to the world. Its sudden absence challenged our very perception of reality. People huddled in groups, seeking comfort in shared confusion and fear. The city, once bustling with life, fell into an uneasy silence, the quiet punctuated only by the sound of footsteps on snow footsteps that belonged to shadowless forms. As the day wore on, reports began to emerge of people disappearing. Just rumors at first, whispers of figures vanishing without a trace, as if they, like their shadows, had been erased from existence. The authorities dismissed these claims as panic-induced hysteria, but the seed of terror had been planted. Nightfall brought no relief. The city plunged into darkness without the street lights, casting their familiar glow, felt alien, unwelcoming. The darkness was oppressive, smothering, as if in the absence of our shadows, the night sought to reclaim what was lost. The shadowless day ended as abruptly as it began, with the rising of the sun the following morning. Our shadows returned faint at first, then as defined as ever, as if the previous day's events had been nothing but a collective hallucination. But the relief was short-lived. The people who were reported missing remained so, their absences a lingering reminder of the day's surreal horror. The authorities launched investigations, scientists proposed theories, but no satisfactory explanation was ever found. The city moved on, as all cities do, but the shadowless day remains etched in the memories of those who experienced it. We talk of it still, in hushed tones a shared trauma that binds us. It's a reminder of the fragility of our understanding of the world, of the thin veil that separates the ordinary from the inexplicable. I left the city soon after, but I carry the memory of that day with me, a memory as sharp and as shadowy as the figures that vanished. It's a story that I share with caution, a tale of a day when the world as we knew it changed, reminding us that there are mysteries that defy explanation, phenomena that challenge our beliefs and our sanity. The shadowless city, for one day, became a place not of this world, a chapter in my life I revisit in dreams and waking nightmares, a story that haunts me still, In the heart of a Canadian winter, under the cloak of nightfall, my tale unfolds on a road less traveled, a path shrouded in snow that stretched beyond the horizon, known to the locals as the unending road. It was a stretch I found myself navigating one chilling evening, driven by a desire to reach home before the storm grew worse. The first oddity struck as the clock struck midnight, my car, a lone traveler, against the vast white expanse, seemed to loop back on itself. Landmarks I swore I'd passed an old, gnarled tree, a dilapidated barn greeted me again like specters in the night. Rational thoughts battled with rising panic. GPS signals faltered, leaving me to the mercy of this endless circuit. The snow intensified, blurring the line between the road and the wilderness. It was then I noticed the absence of any tracks, neither tire marks, nor footprints marred the pristine snow. A suffocating silence enveloped everything, broken only by the crunch of snow beneath my tires. As hours melded into a timeless loop, a sense of deep unease settled over me. The road seemed to narrow, the snow-laden trees leaning closer, as if whispering secrets in a language long forgotten. And shadows danced at the edge of my headlights reach, taking forms that my mind shied away from, shapes not meant to be seen, Fuel dwindling, hope fading, I spotted a figure in the distance. A woman, draped in white, her eyes reflecting the moonlight, stood in the middle of the road. As I slowed, she vanished, like mist, under the morning sun, leaving behind a cold dread that clung to my bones. With the first light of dawn, the road stretched out, unending and unchanged. 
The realization dawned on me then, a truth as cold as the snow that entrapped me this road had no end, no beginning. It was a loop, not of the land, but of something far more ancient, a loop that ensnared not just me, but my very soul. And so here I remain, a prisoner of the unending road, recounting my tale to the silent snow, a warning to those who would follow. For in the heart of the Canadian wilderness lies a road that leads nowhere, a journey without end, where the only escape is to never embark. As an avid traveler, my goal has always been to seek out the Earth's hidden wonders, those places that defy explanation and challenge the limits of belief. My journey to the Gobi Desert was inspired by a fragment of a story I overheard in a crowded marketplace in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. An old merchant, his face etched with the lines of time, spoke of the singing sands, a place in the desert where the sands sang in human voices telling tales of an ancient civilization long forgotten by history. The locals, he said, avoid the area, fearing the voices carry a curse. My curiosity piqued. I set out to find this mysterious place. Traveling through the Gobi is an exercise in endurance the vast, barren landscape stretches endlessly, a sea of sand and rock under the relentless sun. After days of journeying, Guided by a map sketched hastily on the back of an old receipt by the merchant, I began to question the sanity of my quest. But then, just as doubt was about to claim me, I found it a patch of sand dunes, seemingly no different from the thousands I had passed before, yet unmistakably unique. There was a palpable stillness in the air, a silence so deep it felt as if the desert itself was holding its breath. As I stepped onto the sands, a chill ran down my spine, despite the heat of the day. Then the singing began. Soft at first, like a whisper carried by the wind, it grew in strength until it surrounded me, a chorus of voices singing in a language I did not understand, but felt in the very marrow of my bones. The voices told of a time when the desert was a lush oasis, home to a civilization that thrived in harmony with the land. They sang of great achievements, of love and loss, of a people who had mastered the secrets of the sands. But there was a darker note to the melody, a tale of hubris and a forbidden knowledge that led to their downfall. The sands they sang were the last remnants of this once great civilization, a memorial to their existence and a warning to those who would follow in their footsteps. Transfixed, I listened for hours the stories weaving a tapestry of a life so different from my own, as the sun began to set, painting the sky in hues of orange and red, the singing faded, the final notes lingering in the air before disappearing into the silence of the desert. I left the Gobi with more questions than answers. Attempts to find the singing sands again were futile the desert had reclaimed its secret, leaving me to wonder if what I had experienced was real or simply a mirage a trick of the mind conjured by the isolation and the heat. Back in the realm of the mundane, the memory of the singing sands haunts me. I've scoured libraries, consulted experts, searched for any shred of evidence that might validate my experience, but to no avail. The world moves on, oblivious to the mysteries that lie hidden in its deserts, forests, and oceans. The singing sands of the Gobi Desert remain a mystery a whisper from the past that challenges our understanding of history and our place in the world. To those who ask, I tell this story, a testament to the wonder and the fear that comes from encountering the unknown. It's a reminder that there are things in this world beyond our comprehension, secrets that will remain long after we're gone, singing their tales to an empty desert under a vast, uncaring sky. Driving down the coastal road to Bermuda, the air thick with anticipation of the incoming storm, I never imagined I'd witness history, or rather, an anomaly masquerading as it. 
My grandfather had spun tales of the sea, of ships vanishing into the mist, never to be seen again, but they were just that tales until that night. The storm hit with fury, transforming the sea into a writhing entity, its waves like the convulsions of some colossal beast. Seeking shelter, I found myself at the cliff's edge, overlooking the ocean's tempestuous dance. Lightning cleaved the sky, and in the brief luminescence, I saw them a fleet of ghost ships, sails billowing against the gale, locked in a battle that defied time. These spectral vessels bore no resemblance to modern craft. They were relics, galleons and frigates adorned with the banners of forgotten empires, their cannons belching fire and smoke. The sound of their conflict, a cacophony of booming cannons and shattered masts, reached me even above the howl of the storm. I was entranced, rooted to the spot by a mix of fear and fascination. These apparitions, clashing with such ferocity, seemed unaware or indifferent to my presence. As I watched, a smaller ship, its sails ablaze, attempted to flee the battle, heading straight for the cliff below me. In a moment of sheer terror, I realized that if these phantoms were capable of any interaction with the physical world, I was in direct path of their escape. But as quickly as the realization hit, the ship vanished into thin air, just meters from the rocks. The battle raged on, unaffected by its loss. Time seemed irrelevant, the storm, the sea, even my own breathing felt disconnected from the spectacle unfolding before me. The climax of this unearthly battle came abruptly. A massive galleon, bearing scars of countless encounters, turned its broadside to its unseen foe and unleashed a barrage that seemed to split the night itself. And then, silence. The ships, the sound of their warfare, even the storm seemed to pause, holding its breath. In the next flash of lightning, they were gone. The sea calmed as if the storm had been nothing but a dream. Shaken, I made my way back to my car, the images of the battle etched into my memory. I've since researched, dug through archives, and spoken to historians, trying to find any record of a battle that matched what I saw. Nothing. It's as if the event was plucked from the imagination of the sea itself, a ghost story told by the waves. To this day, when the storms roll in, I find myself drawn to that cliff, searching the horizon for the ghost fleet. It has yet to reappear, but the memory of that night lingers, a haunting reminder of the mysteries that lie beyond our understanding, hidden in the storms swept waters off the coast of Bermuda. Last year I embarked on a journey through India, fueled by a desire to explore its rich tapestry of culture and history. My travels took me to a remote temple in the north, known for its breathtaking architecture and ancient statues. The temple, a relic of a bygone era, sat atop a hill overlooking a sleepy village. The locals revered the temple, not just for its religious significance, but for a phenomenon that both fascinated and terrified them the living statues. The priest, an elderly man with a kind face and eyes that seemed to hold centuries of wisdom, welcomed me with open arms. Over a cup of chai, he shared the temple's history, how it had stood the test of time, surviving wars and natural disasters, a testament to the divine. But when I mentioned the living statues, his demeanor changed, a shadow crossing his features. It's true, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. The gods walk among us at night. And skepticism was my initial reaction. Surely there was a logical explanation, pranks perhaps, or an elaborate hoax. But curiosity overpowered my doubts, and I decided to stay the night, to witness these so-called miracles for myself. The temple was different at night. The silence amplified every shadow a mystery. The statues, magnificent during the day, now seemed imposing their faces caught in expressions of anger, sorrow, and joy. I chose a spot where I could see the entire hall, my camera at the ready. Midnight came and went, and I fought to keep my eyes open, the silence lulling me into a near trance. It was then that I heard it a sound so faint 
I thought it a figment of my imagination, the scrape of stone against stone, so soft it was almost inaudible. My heart raced as I trained my camera on the statues, the digital display, my only source of light. What I saw through the lens defied all logic. The statues were moving, ever so slightly, their positions changing with such subtlety it was almost imperceptible. A hand raised here, a head turned there, as if they were alive, engaging in some silent discourse known only to them. The fear rooted me to the spot, a cold sweat breaking out on my forehead. I wanted to run, to scream, but I was transfixed, unable to look away from the impossible scene unfolding before me. Hours passed, or perhaps it was minutes, time losing all meaning in the face of the unexplainable. With the first light of dawn, the movement ceased, the statues returning to their original positions, as if nothing had happened. I left the temple as soon as the sun rose, my mind a whirlwind of questions. The photographs I had taken showed nothing out of the ordinary, the statues as inert as any piece of stone. The villagers listened to my tale with a mix of fear and resignation. The gods reveal themselves to whom they choose, one old woman told me. Her voice tinged with a reverence I now understood. I left the village that day, my view of the world forever altered. I've traveled since, seen wonders that defy explanation, but nothing has stayed with me quite like the living statues. The experience has become a part of me, a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the realm of understanding. I share this story not as proof, but as a testament to the unknown, to the miracles and terrors that exist in the shadows of our world. The living statues of that remote Indian temple are a mystery I once sought to solve, but now I wonder if some things are better left unexplained, revered from afar but never fully understood. The phenomenon started on an evening cloaked in fog, thick enough to swallow the world whole. It was on such a night, under a blanket of impenetrable mist, that I first encountered the bridge. Local lore whispered of a bridge that appeared at whim, a relic of an age forgotten, bridging not just land but time itself. I had always dismissed such tales as fanciful myths, until that fateful night when curiosity, fueled by tales soaked in pints of ale, drove me into the fog. Walking along the familiar path, my surroundings blurred into a world unrecognizable, the air thick, with a silence so dense it muffled the very beat of my heart. It was then, amidst the silence, that the outline of a structure loomed before me. A bridge, its arches lost to the fog, stood defiantly against the void. The very air around it seemed to pulse with an unseen energy, a whisper of ages passed. Compelled by a force I couldn't explain, I stepped onto the bridge. The moment my foot touched the ancient stones, the fog intensified, swirling around me in a vortex of whispering shadows. I pressed on, each step taking me further from the world I knew. When the fog finally cleared, I stood on the other side, but it was not the same. The air held a crispness unfamiliar, the sky a hue of twilight I had never seen. Before me lay a village, but not mine. It was akin to stepping into a painting from another era. People dressed in garments of a bygone age bustled about, none giving me more than a passing glance, as if my modern attire was but a trifle not worth noting. I wandered through this world lost to time, a specter unseen and untouched by its inhabitants. A realization dawned on me, chilling in its clarity I had crossed into another time. Panic set in with the setting sun. The thought of being trapped in this temporal anomaly, away from everything and everyone I knew, spurred me into action. I retraced my steps, praying the bridge would be where I left it. The relief at seeing the arches emerge from the twilight was palpable. I crossed back into the fog, the voices of the past fading with each step, until the familiar sights of my village came into view, the mist dissipating around me as if it had never been. Since that night, the bridge has haunted my thoughts, an ever-present siren call to explore what lies beyond. I've returned on foggy nights, 
seeking the passage, but it remains elusive, a ghost bridge appearing at whims beyond my understanding. The experience has left me with more questions than answers. Was it a glimpse into the past, a slip through the cracks of time, or merely a figment of my imagination, spurred by the legends and isolation of my surroundings? I may never know, but the bridge between worlds, whether real or imagined, has changed me, opened my eyes to the possibilities that lie just beyond the veil of our understanding. My work with an NGO brought me to various corners of the globe, often to places that were as beautiful as they were challenging. Our mission was straightforward, provide clean water to those in need. This mission led me to a remote village in Africa, a place so isolated, it was as if it had been forgotten by time itself. The journey was arduous, roads less traveled turning into mere footpaths, until we arrived. What we found there was beyond anything I could have anticipated a village silenced, where voices could not bridge the gap between us and them. The villagers were welcoming, gestures and smiles bridging the language barrier that my limited knowledge couldn't. We set to work, but it was during our breaks, in our attempts to engage more personally with the community, that we noticed something unsettling. Our words, it seemed, fell on deaf ears, and their replies, though their lips moved, reached us as nothing more than silence. It was as if an invisible barrier stood between us, a filter that stripped sound from our interactions. At first we thought it a strange local custom, perhaps a form of silent protest against outsiders. But as we observed their interactions with each other, laughter and conversation filling the air, the reality of our situation became undeniably clear. They could not hear us, and we could not hear them. It was as if we existed in parallel realities, only visually overlapping. Panic did not set, and immediately confusion held its ground. We communicated through written words, tedious process that bore fruit. They told us of the silence that had descended upon their village years ago, a curse, they believed, for a transgression forgotten by all but the ancestors, a punishment that left them voiceless to the world beyond their borders and made outsiders mute to their ears. The days passed, our work progressing despite the barrier between us, but the silence wore on us, a psychological burden that strained our nerves. The villagers, though accustomed to their silent world, showed signs of strain too, their eyes conveying a desperation words could not. Our attempts to understand the nature of this phenomenon were futile. Equipment we brought showed normal sound levels, Recordings played back voices and noises clearly, but in real time, silence reigned supreme. It was as if the very fabric of reality was altered within the confines of the village, a bubble where sound was an outsider. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of fire, an elder approached me. Through written word, he shared a legend a story of a time when their village was a sanctuary of knowledge, a place where secrets of the earth were spoken freely. But with time came arrogance, a belief that they were beyond the reach of the gods, and as punishment, their voices were taken from them, a reminder that some knowledge was meant to remain unspoken. We left the village with more questions than answers, our project completed, but our minds troubled. Back in the cacophony of the modern world, the sounds we once took for granted now felt overwhelming, each noise a reminder of the silence we had escaped. The voiceless village remains a mystery, a place I often revisit in my dreams, where silence has a weight, a texture, and a presence. It's a story I share with hesitation, a glimpse into a reality where voices are lost, and silence speaks volumes. A reminder of the fragility of our understanding of the world, and of the truths that lie just beyond the reach of our senses. The first time I witnessed the rain of lights, I was deep within Brazil's vast rainforest, 
part of a research team studying the region's unique biodiversity. Our camp was a speck amidst the sprawling green, isolated, hours away from the nearest outpost of civilization. The phenomenon started as whispers among the local guides, tales of nights when the sky would weep lights, a spectacle unseen by the outside world. We, the uninitiated, laughed it off as folklore, the forest's way of speaking to those who dared to listen. But then, one night, as the darkness embraced our camp, the forest's voice manifested. It began subtly, a flicker here, a flash there, like the first drops of rain signaling an impending storm. But instead of rain, it was light that descended upon us. Hundreds, thousands of luminescent droplets poured from the void above, bathing the forest in a glow surreal and otherworldly. The light's myriad in color moved with purpose, swirling, dancing, as if the air itself had come alive. Captivated, we watched from our encampment, a collective breath held in awe. The phenomenon defied explanation. There were no clouds, no source from which these lights could originate. They simply were beacons in the night, guiding, calling, driven by a need to understand, or perhaps a desire to touch the divine I ventured out. The forest under the rain of lights was transformed. Every leaf shimmered, every shadow danced. The world around me was alive in a way I had never felt before. As I moved deeper, the air grew thick, charged with an energy palpable and intense. The light swirled around me, close enough to touch, yet always just beyond reach. And then, without warning, they converged, coalescing into a singular, radiant entity before me. Its form was indescribable, shifting, a living constellation bound to the earth. It spoke not with words but with emotions, a flood of understanding and connection of truths too vast for human comprehension. In its presence, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace, a knowledge that we are but a small part of something infinite. But as quickly as it appeared, the entity dispersed, the light scattering back into the night, leaving me alone in the darkness, the silence of the forest now a deafening roar in my ears. I returned to the camp, my mind reeling, my words inadequate to describe what had transpired. My colleagues saw the change in me, a shift in understanding, a transformation wrought by the forest's secret. The reign of lights remains a mystery, a phenomenon unexplained by the science we hold so dear. Some nights when the world is quiet, I find myself longing for the forest's embrace, to stand once more under the radiant downpour and feel the connection that transcends time and space. This tale, drawn from the depths of the unknown, serves as a reminder of the wonders that lie just beyond the veil of our understanding in the heart of Brazil's rainforest, where the rain of lights weaves its magic, unseen, unforgotten. Driving across the country was supposed to be an adventure, a way to escape the monotony of my daily routine. I stumbled upon the town of Elleryville by chance, a detour taken on a whim, lured by the promise of a scenic route through what looked like a slice of quintessential small-town America. Little did I know I was stepping into a mystery that would challenge my grasp on reality. Elleryville was picturesque, nestled between rolling hills, its streets lined with quaint shops and homes that harked back to a simpler time. It was late afternoon when I arrived, the town bathed in the golden hue of the setting sun. The people I passed offered friendly nods and smiles, an air of contentment hanging over the town like a comforting blanket. Seeking a place to rest, I checked into the local inn, a charming, if somewhat dated, establishment run by a kindly older couple, the Harpers. Over dinner, they shared stories of Elleryville, painting a picture of a community unspoiled by the outside world, where life was peaceful and change came slowly, if at all. That night I slept deeply, the silence of the town a stark contrast to the city noises I was accustomed to. But when I awoke, something felt amiss, 
the calendar in my room which I had noted was a day behind, now showed the same date as yesterday. I figured in an oversight and thought little of it until I ventured out. The town was exactly as it had been the day before. The same people walked the streets, engaging in what appeared to be identical conversations. The same cars drove by, the same children played in the park, and even the specials at the local diner hadn't changed. It was as if the town had reset, replaying the previous day with eerie precision. Confused, I approached a local, attempting to broach the subject. The response was a puzzled look, an assurance that today was indeed today, and any suggestion to the contrary was met with bemusement. Panic set in as the day progressed, mirroring the one before in uncanny detail. Night fell and with it, the hope that the next sunrise would bring an end to the loop. But morning came, and the date remained the same, the town resetting once again. I tried to leave, to drive out of Elleryville, but each attempt ended with me driving in circles, always ending up back in the center of town, as if an unseen force was keeping me there. The realization that I was trapped in this time loop, with no apparent way out, was suffocating. Days passed, or perhaps it was the same day repeated, my sense of time unraveling. I searched desperately for answers, for any clue that might explain the phenomenon, or offer a way to break the cycle. Count's history offered no insights. It was on what felt like the tenth repetition of the same day, that I found at a diary in the local library, hidden away in a forgotten corner. The diary belonged to a resident who had experienced the loop, a visitor who had become a permanent fixture of the town. The entries were fragmented, the handwriting increasingly erratic, but the message was clear there was no escape for Mallaryville. The final entry was a resigned acceptance of their fate, a life lived in endless repetition, the diary offered no solutions, only confirmation of my worst fears. I am writing this now, a record of my experience, though I have no way of knowing if it will reset with the town, or if, by some miracle, it will escape the loop and be found by someone outside. Elleryville remains a picturesque prison, a town lost in time, its secret hidden in plain sight. If you find this, know that I tried to leave, to warn the outside world. But like the town itself, I am trapped, destined to live the same day over and over, a visitor unnoticed by the time loop town.